week, as I was thinking about getting back together, um, my mind was just going to some, some verses. And one of them was Psalm 122, verse 1. It says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So can I rejoice together with you that let us go to the house of the Lord. And, and you know where the house of the Lord is, wherever we're gathered together. It's wherever we're gathered together. It just happens to be in this room right here, right now. In Psalm 84.10, it says that better is one day, God, in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. It's so much better to be with you in your presence, Lord. I would rather be a doorkeeper, it says, in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And then Jesus said, forever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. And so God is here with us. We're gathered in the name of Christ. He's here with us. It's just such a joy to be here together. It's Pentecost Sunday, and um, I'm, I'm just expecting big things. Hey, I really do want to ask you this morning, even as I'm preaching, just to, to allow yourself to begin receiving from the Lord what he's saying to you, what, how he's ministering to you, even, even now, even this morning. You know, I'm, just, I'm just a messenger. I'm up here talking. I got a microphone on and all that, but, but I really want us to be hearing from God. I want us to be hearing what he's saying, how he's leading us, what he's prompting inside of us this morning and really every morning. Every morning. So we're back together in person. But what are we back for? Why are we back? What does it matter? So I was seeking the Lord. I was asking him that question myself. So what are we coming back for, God? It was kind of working. That online thing was kind of working. I finally figured it out. I got it all down, and now we're, now we're going in this new kind of hybrid, new normal, new everything. And why are we getting back together? Why are we getting back together? And here was, here was the answer the Lord gave me. He said, when you come back together, I'm calling you back to the basics. I'm like, what? Come on, how about, how about to the new whiz-bang thing, you know, that you want to do? And no, he says, I'm calling you back to the basics. Back to the basics. So that's going to be our focus this morning. What is God saying? What does he mean by us, his church, getting back to the basics? What are the basics? I don't believe it's an accident that the Lord is bringing us back together on Pentecost Sunday. I mean, let's remember what Pentecost Sunday is. It's the launch of the church. That day of Pentecost is when the church launched, when it was filled with power, it came out of the upper room, and truly became the church in our world today, the New Testament church. The answer to all those prophetic words. And so... As we look at that, if we look at the early church, I believe the Lord is pointing us back to what the basics looked like as we look to the early church of Pentecost. Even that day of Pentecost, what does it look like to be the church? Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 1 through 4. Acts 2, 1 through 4. Okay, remember, back to the basics. Here we go. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Isn't it great to be all together? So this is the gathering of the saints. We're calling this now in this room the regathering of the saints. All right, anyway. So the day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place. And then suddenly, I want to stop here for a moment and just say that we love suddenlies in the Bible, but suddenlies aren't just accidents. They're not just kind of um, spiritual heaven explosions that happen. There's, there's typically um, something that is, has set up the suddenly. Like the obedience of God's people to do what Christ called them to do. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the suddenly, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, so they're all together in one place in that upper room on the day of Pentecost. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. We're sitting. You're sitting. I'm not. But Then they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. The separating came to rest on each of them. And all of them. Not just the disciples, the apostles, but everyone in that upper room, about 120 people. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of them began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. Back to the basics. Back to the basics. The church is launched. The church is filled with the Holy Spirit, and they launch. We're going to look into that a little bit more. Okay, you ready to get back to the basics? Before we do, I want to, I want to make a statement. It's from Jeremiah 6, verse 16. 
Jeremiah 6, verse 16 says, the Lord says, stand at the crossroads. I believe we're at a crossroads right now in the life of the church, in the life of the world, the nation. We just had something unprecedented happen that the whole world kind of stopped. Church even stopped gathering together in person. You know, there was like this, this moment where the sun stood still. I heard about that happening one other time, right? Wasn't quite that dramatic, but it's similar. We're at a crossroads right now. And Jeremiah says, stand at the crossroads. Stand where you are right now and look. And then he says, ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. So that's been my prayer. God, where is the good way? I want to walk in it. What is the ancient path that you have for your people, your church? Because we don't want to walk our own path. We don't want to just go launching into something new because it, it seems like the right thing. God, we want to know the right way. We want to know the ancient path, God, and we want to walk in it. And he says, and when you walk in it, you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Well, I'm here to say, we will walk in it. Amen? You you all want to say that? All right, why don't you say that then? Say, we will walk in it. All right, amen. All right, because I've been saying that all week long, so thank you. We will walk in it. So back to the day of Pentecost. We look at the day of Pentecost, by the way, it was 10 days after Jesus ascended to be at the right hand of the Father, which is where he's at right now. The Son of God, our Savior, is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Come on, you have the most amazing advocate, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, making intercession for you. Know that when you pray. Know that when you cry out to him. And he hears you. And he cares. And he loves you. So back to the day of Pentecost. When we look at the day of Pentecost, I believe it really is a picture of what the ancient path looks like. And when I'm talking about the ancient path, I'm talking about the ancient path of the church. The day of Pentecost is when the church started. And I want to walk that path. I don't want to jump ahead. I don't want to jump around. I want to walk the path that God created for his New Testament church, operating under the new covenant, filled with his grace, doing the things that he did and even greater things. I want to walk that path. And I want to ask you all right now, do you want to take a walk with me? Do you want to walk that ancient path with me? Do you want to get back to the basics with me? I pray that we do because I, I just believe God has so much for us. I mean, I believe we can even be like that, that initial church that let's just spend that time just waiting on what God has for us over the next 10, 20, 30 days, whatever, God, whatever that time period is, and let's walk that ancient path and wait for what God wants to do, what he wants to pour out. So this ancient path begins with a trailhead. You know, every trail starts with a trailhead. It's where, where the trail starts, right? And the trailhead to this ancient path that we see right here in God's Word, we're not just making up some new path. This is the ancient path, the, the path of the, the New Testament church. That trailhead started and starts with gathering. Do we want to get back to the basics? It starts with gathering. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They were all together, socially distanced, but all together. They weren't. We are, anyway, in one place. In fact, that all together thing, it's common. When you read the book of Acts, which if you haven't done that lately, do it because it'll just fill you with zeal and excitement for what is truly possible, what should be normal for us as believers, as the church today. But as you look in the book of Acts, almost every single time, I mean almost every time that there was a suddenly, that there was a big move of God, a miracle uh, 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 something dramatic, an outpouring of heaven into the world and onto the church. Almost every time it was when the people of God were gathered together. Like in the same room, like gathered together. That's something to take note of. If we want to walk that ancient path, if we want to go where it takes us, this is the trailhead. This is step one, the gathering of the saints. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, you're probably familiar with this, but he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Amen? God's faithful. You know that God promised the Holy Spirit to the church if they would go back to Jerusalem and wait for it. Was he faithful? He was faithful. He was faithful. God is faithful. And so, verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on Toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some 
are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, even more so as you see the day, that's a capital D, as you see the day approaching. That's the return of Christ. And so let me just point this out. The need for us to gather together, the need for us to press into the things of God, to walk this ancient path that God has for his church, isn't decreasing as time goes by. It's increasing. It's increasing as the day of the return of Christ is coming. So as we're, as we're studying the word of God, too many people look at it and go, well, that was, for the, that was for the early church, and now we're kind of in a different spot right now. No, 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 no. We're going to get into that a little bit more here in just a moment. Okay, so the writer of Hebrews understood that there were some people that were forsaking the gathering of the saints, and that was affecting their spiritual walk, and it was affecting the life of the church. And so he's encouraging the believers, this writer of Hebrews, saying, don't do that. Don't forsake it. Because the whole ancient path, the whole thing that God has designed starts with gathering. And if you skip over the gathering, then you've missed it. You, you've just missed it. I read an interesting quote this week. Snowflakes, it says. I'm not talking about political snowflakes. <laughs> all right? I'm talking about real snowflakes that fall out of the sky. You know, those little snowflakes. Everyone different, right? Every snowflake is different, right? But anyway, snowflakes are one of nature's most fragile things. But just look at what they can do when they stick together. <laughs> now, I, I grew up my grade school years in, in Minnesota. I'd wear the big snowmobile suit out. It, it was like snowy 10 months out of the year, something like that up there. It was insane, right? Yeah. There was a lot of snow. It was cold. Um, I'd get all bundled up. All you could see were my eyes. And Anyway, we didn't have fancy goggles and stuff back then. You know, We were just... Um, country kids back then so uh, but I get all bundled up we would go out and there'd be a bunch of snow well we would take those snowflakes which by the way I love that quote it says that each snowflake a snowflake is fragile it sure is if a snowflake by its own falls and like falls on your cheek it usually just melts it's gone snowflakes are fragile we're fragile think about that I'm fragile left to myself all alone Man, I'll get in my head and stuff. It'll, be, it'll get crazy. I need people around me to stick to me, like to help me. You know, I'm fragile. We're all fragile. Well, so what we would do, though, let me get back to Minnesota and being a kid. We would go out. We'd take those snowflakes, and we'd put them together. We'd make a fort. And sometimes we would be kind of stupid, and we'd make the fort, like, right by the road because that's where the plow came through and put all the big snow. And dangerous. Don't do that. You don't need to worry about that with your kids here in Arizona, down here south. But, um, the other thing that we did, though, with snowflakes, with snow, is we'd make snowballs. We would. And uh, the older we got, we'd, we'd begin to find out that, you know, if you add a little bit of water to that snowball at the end, it gets really hard, you know what I'm saying? And anyway, we'd have snowball fights. It was a great time. My point is this. The reason I like that quote for this week is that, man, we're all fragile, alone. But when we come together, God brings us together. We come together. He makes us into that snowball, man. He can do something with that. He can do something with that. Gathering is so important. Us being together is so important to the move of God in and through the church. When God shows up, when we gather, people change. I mean, I can look around this room and I can think of all the change that's happened in people's lives. I mean, significant change has gone on because of the gathering of the saints. Because of encouraging one another, building each other up, experiencing what God, praying for one another, seeing God come, just come down and do a miracle in people's lives, the healings that have happened. Because we come together, we lay hands, we anoint with oil, we pray, we just do things God's way. And God shows up. God shows up. So back to the basics begins with this simple act of gathering. But what are we called to do when we gather? Okay, so we come together. What are we called to do when we gather? If Pentecost is our roadmap to the ancient path, we're going to pray. It starts with gathering, but it moves into praying. When we're coming together, we're praying. Go back to Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Acts 1, verse 12. It says, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. Why did they go back to Jerusalem? Because Jesus told them to. You know that God's told us to do a lot of things right here. He's told us to do a lot of things. He's given us a path. He's given us the, the, the direction that we're to go. 
the next step to take. He's told us a lot of things. Well, that early church, they heard the words of the Lord Jesus, and they obeyed. They went back to Jerusalem, right? And from the hill called the Mount of Olives, it was a Sabbath day's walk. Sabbath day, again, was a shorter day. They could only, they could only walk so far on Sabbath day, so it was a shorter walk. It was very close. Actually, the Mount of Olives is extremely close to Jerusalem. But when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. But check this out, verse 14. So they all get together in a room, right? And it says, it says that they all join together constantly doing what? Praying. They joined together constantly in prayer. They went to where Jesus told them to go. He said, gather together and wait. And they got to that place, and the way they waited was they prayed. They prayed, along with all the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. There's about 120 people in that room praying, just waiting for the promises of God. Again, gathering and praying and waiting for the promises of God for his church, right here. So do we want to walk in the ancient path? Do we want Pentecost to be the normal Christian living? I do. I do. I do. Then it starts with gathering together and praying. It's that simple. It seems, and and not just just once in a while. Notice, and I'm not calling us to a 10-day, 24-7 prayer meeting right now, so don't hear what I'm not saying, right? But I will tell you, there is something about this church for over 11 years praying every single Wednesday night. Being faithful to that. There's something to including prayer as a regular rhythm of your life. There just is. Because God shows up in that. It's, it's part of the ancient path. It's part of what he's designed the church to be doing. It's gathering and praying. What would have happened if that, if that group of people didn't gather and didn't pray? Would Pentecost Sunday, would that Pentecost have happened in that way? Well, let's keep looking at this, okay? Let's keep looking at this. You know, the Lord spoke to this church. I don't know how many of you are familiar with our vision statement, but the Lord gave us the vision statement. Really, it's kind of an identity of who we are as a church, the vision statement. And he calls Evident Life Church, he said that you're a people of prayer, pursuing God and loving others. That's our vision statement. A people of prayer. And I'm grateful that he called us to be a people of prayer. And I'm grateful to be running with so many people who who come to the place of prayer. And who gather in prayer and who understand the importance of that. Because I'm telling you, that's the heartbeat of this church. That's the heartbeat, in my opinion, as I read this, that's how my opinion is formed. That's the heartbeat of the church. Is a, is a group of people that will pray together and make it a regular thing. You know, they gathered 10 days constantly praying before Pentecost happened. Because they were called to do that. They were told to go and wait until the Holy Spirit comes. Now, they didn't continue to pray every single day in the same place all the time. But when we read Acts 2, 42 through 47, we understand that prayer was still a regular part and a regular part of the rhythm of their life. Prayer continued to be a regular rhythm. The gathering together of prayer. I'm not talking about the like individual prayer in your prayer closet. That's important. We all need to be doing that. Hopefully every day, right? But I'm talking about the gathering of the saints, that kind of corporate prayer, a regular part of the basics, that ancient path. Okay. I know I'm probably, this is so complicated, isn't it, right now? You know? Gather and pray. But and it seems, okay, come on, Pastor, tell us something exciting and new. Now, I'm telling you, we got to get back to the basics because that's where the exciting and new happens. Yeah. It happens in that ancient path. It happens, you know, just doing things God's way. And it's not complicated. God has not made this complicated for us. It's just not. He's saying, get together in the name of my son, Jesus. Pray and wait for what I'm going to do. All right. I like keeping things simple, too. So this resonates with me. Um, You know, here's the deal, though. Let me, let me, before we go into point number three, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be straight up because as I'm coming out of this quarantine time, I'm just motivated to like just be like so real 
in like in a kind pastoral way, but I think this is the right thing for a pastor to do is just to speak plainly, you know, about things and just like let's just talk and let's be real about this. Because see, I'm gonna stand before the Lord someday and I'm gonna give an account and all whatever I preached and said and how I led is gonna be put up there and it's either gonna burn up or it's gonna be be left, right? And so I want to just say what 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 God says here. Here's the deal. There are so many people who want Pentecost. They want the Pentecost experience without the gathering and the praying. So I would bet every Christian wants the wow of God, God to show up and bless them and, and you know, all of this kind of stuff in their life. They want, they want the presence of God in their life. But too many people want that Pentecost experience, that power, supernatural, wonderful work of God in their life without the gathering and the praying. And so I just want to be real about it. If you want more of God, if you want more of his move, gather and pray with the saints. I'm just being real. That's the prescription. That's, that's God's word. That's not a pastor trying to get people to come to a meeting. All right? That's not it. Because we've done Wednesday night prayers with my wife and I, and we're the only ones in there. Now, that was years ago. We're getting 50 to 90 people now because this is a people of prayer pursuing God and loving others, right, man? And, and God's moving. But, but it's, so it's not about the numbers. It's just about this is what God says, and I want to just preach what he says so we can all walk in the ancient path, so we can all get back to the basics and be the people of God and not miss out on what he has for us. Um, this is another thing I want to say about all of this before I keep going. Um, so Pentecost introduced this kind of supernatural, these, these, this baptism of the Holy Spirit. It introduced tongues. It introduced the supernatural being a normal part of the church that actually was visible to the world. This is something that, 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 that hit me on Wednesday as we were in prayer. We were in prayer and, and, and something was brought up about feelings and how we shouldn't operate on feelings. And it just all hit me and I cannot believe I've never heard this before. I've never seen this before myself even. And that is that, that so often those who embrace and want to walk this ancient path of the Holy Spirit just baptizing us, showing up, pouring out his gifts in us, operating in, in everything he has, prophecy, words of knowledge, tongues, interpretations, healings, miracles. So often the people that, that want that are, call, are, are labeled as, oh, you're just operating out of your feelings. You're just looking for, for feelings. And it hit me on Wednesday. It's actually a 180 degree difference than that. It's actually, in my view, people that shy away from the ancient path of Pentecost, of the teachings of the Apostle Paul about the gifts of the Spirit and the move of the Spirit, about how we see the Holy Spirit moving in power through the church throughout the book of Acts. The people who back away from that, are actually the ones operating in feelings. I just want to share that very clear right now. I'm so convinced of that. Fear, what are people going to think? I'm out of control. Pride steps in. All of these things step in. It takes faith, and it takes walking by such a faith that we believe the fact in such a way that we're going to ask for it, that we're going to do what the Word of God says. The Apostle Paul says, eagerly desire the things of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, I don't feel like it. But we don't operate out of feeling. We operate out of faith and fact. Faith and fact. This is how the church was launched. This is instrumental in the body of Christ. This is what we're encouraged by the apostles to be expecting and to be operating in. We're even told to eagerly desire it. And so we're not going to operate out of feelings. Oh, but what if I get it wrong? What if it's weird? What if it's different? Those are all feelings. Those are all things that will trap us and keep us and block us from all that God has. Now... We're going to operate in faith and fact, and part of the fact is this, 1 Corinthians 14, it's order too. So we're going to operate in order. We're going to do it God's way, but we're going to believe it. We're going to seek it. We're going to expect it because we're the New Testament church. We're the descendants, if you will, the spiritual descendants of these 120 people that were in that upper room. And what God had for them, he has for us, and even more so as the day is approaching. So there we go. So it starts with gathering. When they're gathering, then you're praying. And the third thing that I'm seeing here, this ancient path of Pentecost is receiving. If we're gathering and praying, then we're going to be in a position of receiving. And we're going to be receiving because as we read earlier, God is faithful. He's faithful. 
And if we do things his way, then we're going to receive what he says we're going to receive. It's really that simple again. So we gather, we pray, and then we receive. Suddenly, as they were gathering and praying, verse 2 of chapter 2, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to receive something there, right? They received that baptism of the Holy Spirit. They received power of God starting to move in him. Jesus said we would do what he did and even greater things. He promised that the Holy Spirit would come and baptize the church, right? And so they began to receive what was promised because they positioned themselves the way Jesus told them to be positioned, and that's gather and pray. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So here's how my simple mind works. If I want to receive more of what the Holy Spirit has for me and my church, then I'm going to gather and pray. The the amount of gathering and praying, I believe, is going to be pretty much directly related to the amount of receiving that's going to happen. But I'm gathering and praying as God is directing to gather and pray. Anyway. Receiving the fullness of God's presence, anointing, and grace is amazing. How many of you know that? How many of you experienced that before? You experienced the powerful move of God in and through your life. It's amazing. It can be scary, too, but we get beyond that feeling. It's amazing. It's so amazing. Receiving what God has is amazing. And I could sit here and talk a whole message, teach a whole, preach a whole message or two about receiving and what it is he has us to receive. But I want to dive into the, to the next thing because we're not just receiving. That's not, that's not the end of it all. We don't just gather, pray, and receive. We gather, pray, receive for a purpose, to release. To release. We're receiving for the purpose that we will have something to release into the lives of others. And and Scripture says in Acts 20, verse 35, it's better to give. It's better to release than to receive. But we have to receive first so we have something to release. And to receive, we gather, we pray, we wait. For what God has and has promised for his church. But receiving is really just so that we would be in a place to be able to release. So that brings us to point number four is releasing. We're gathering, we're praying, we're receiving, and we are releasing. And the church that's walking this ancient path of the New Testament church, of the church of Pentecost, is going to be a church that's going to be releasing a whole lot into our world. Releasing. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. It gathered people. They went out into the the streets with what they've received. And and a whole massive crowd in in, in Jerusalem showed up going, what is going on? What's happening with these people? Somebody might think, well, Pentecost. It was just kind of a flash in the pan. It was a one-time thing. Is God just kind of showing up and, and kind of just wanting to make a big scene in order to kind of kickstart the church? And then after that, you know, whatever happens, happens, and it's just kind of like, well, whatever, right? No, that's not, how, that's not how God rolls. That's not how he rolls. And so, so everybody's looking at what's going on. They're seeing the supernatural, something they've never seen before. They're confused. You know, they were saying, oh, they must be drunk. You know that people today, even Christians today, still think, that, that believers who, who are operating in, in these strange kinds of things, that, that they're somehow overtaken by something else or something, you know? Anyway, that's another thing, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. So, um, anyway, so the Apostle Peter makes sure that everybody there understands. They're asking, what's happening right now? What's going on? And the Apostle Peter says, this isn't something that's unexpected. This is something, he kicks off his whole sermon now full of boldness because he's filled with the Holy Spirit, not some coward any longer. He's filled with what God had for him because without that, he would not be able to be one of the apostles in the church, spreading and growing the church, right? So he's filled with the boldness of God. And the first thing he does is he answers the question, what's happening? He says, well, let me tell you, it's prophesied of years and years ago. The prophet Joel prophesied exactly this. This is just exactly what God already let us know was going to happen. And so he starts off his whole sermon of power with, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. 
Do you say, do you say on, on, on the disciples, the only the guys who walked with Jesus those three years? No, 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 no. He said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And he's going to tell us what all people mean here in just a bit. Your sons and daughters, doesn't matter how old you are, all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servant, both men and women. All people. Doesn't matter who you are, what stage of life you're in, whatever, right? All people. I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show them wonders in the heaven, heavens above and signs on the earth below. Signs and wonders. He's saying, you want to know what's happening? This is what's happening. Signs and wonders. The Holy Spirit baptizing the church. It's going to a whole nother level right now. I will show wonders in the heaven Signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The ancient path. Peter's explaining what's going on. He's saying this is what the New Testament church looks like. The New Testament church has just been launched. It's just happened. God set it all up through his son Jesus. And this group of people who obeyed Jesus and went to that upper room gathering and praying received. And are, this is the beginning of this normal Christian living right here. Of the Spirit of God being poured out on all people. But again, we can't give that stuff out unless we've received it first. Amen? And then Peter, let's see here. So Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's preaching with power now. He gets down to the end of his message, and they ask him, well, what must we do to be saved? Now, Peter just had preached the gospel message. The first time the gospel message of Jesus Christ had truly been preached out in public, Peter just preached it with a whole lot of power and zeal because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. People are like, they're, they're moved to make a decision. They're moved to walk into this new life that's in Christ Jesus. What must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you too will receive this. You too will be part of this move, of this, of this ancient path, this New Testament church that's being launched right now. And it says 3,000 people said yes to Jesus, repented and were baptized on that day and added to the church on that day. That is the power of the Holy Spirit moving in and through the church. In and through the church. I would say that as, as amazing as the spiritual gifts are as evidence of the, the move and the power of the Holy Spirit, which they are, and they need to be evidence because the Bible says that this is normal Christian living and will happen and there's a purpose for it. There's a purpose for it, but as meaningful and as important that is, I believe the most important thing that happened on Pentecost was the fact that being baptized in the Holy Spirit gives you boldness. Boldness to proclaim the word of God and, and an understanding to be able to receive the true word of God and then release it in a way that's effective and that will truly bring a harvest and grow the family of God and bring people out of darkness into the mighty, glorious light of Christ Jesus. The ancient path. And it's not hard to do this. Gather, pray, receive. In other words, get filled, get filled. And release it. And the harvest will come. It's that word that God gave me those years ago. Be who you are. It's not, it's not hard. Just be who you are. Peter and the rest of them, just they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They just went out and they just were who they were at that moment. Spirit-filled believers. The New Testament church. Be who you are. Say what you know. Peter just said what he knew. And they gave him what they had. They released what they'd been given. That's what we need to do. That's who we need to be. It's not that hard. It's simple. Okay, it is hard sometimes. Just <laughs> we got to get past ourselves, right? We just got to trust and obey. Trust and obey. So we're going to end with the fifth point. That, that as the ancient path comes to an end, we find ourselves harvesting. Isn't that awesome? Again, 3,000 people. There was a harvest on the day of Pentecost. The result of the, of the people of God gathering of praying, of receiving and releasing. The result was a harvest, a harvest of souls. Jesus receiving the reward 
of his suffering. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So coming out of this COVID-19 season, I mean, we're still in it. It's still out there. Um, But things are transitioning. Um, Coming out of this, coming back together, I will tell you what, I'm desperate for this. And I'm driven. I'm driven to not miss something. I want to walk in this. I want to walk in this. I want to live this out. I want to be this. Back to the basics. Walk in that ancient path, that New Testament church. Committed to gathering and praying and receiving and releasing, releasing, releasing. Time is short. My youngest is 16 years old already. He's my baby, right? He's 16 years old. He's the tallest of the boys. He likes that too. Um, Time is short. Time flies by. And it's no joke. As uh, Francis Schaeffer said, how should we then live? How should we then live? Time is short, and this is for all the marbles. How should we then live? Today, I'm seeing the answer to that question is, well, we should live like the early church lived. We should gather. We should pray. We should receive. We should release. And we should enjoy watching the harvest come in. Amen.